Welp, uh, this is off my schedule a bit, but it has to be done. Last week, on September 3rd, Warriors released what seems now to be its annual super edition, Ivy Pool's Heart. This is the first book in a while that the team expressed particularly strong excitement for, planning it far ahead as the first part of some longer story that will continue into the 18th Super Edition. So, of course, I had to get to it as soon as possible. And having read it, this was certainly an ambitious book, and the passion is evident all the way through. It certainly had its rough areas and falls prey to some of the poor construction Warriors often employs, but for what it is, and especially in comparison to the recent Super Editions, I was really happy with this book. There's quite a bit to tackle here, and I don't think anyone was expecting most of this. As a result, if you'd still like to read the book for yourself, I urge you to jump off here, because there will be an abundance of spoilers ahead. Also, keep in mind that from this point onward, I'm going to use a much looser editing style because I'm doing this quickly in between two other videos and because I'm busy with the start of school. Let's start off small, though. This book actually gives us the most extensive territory map we have seen so far, and they travel to almost all of the new places on this map over the course of the story. They explore a beach, mountain peaks, two-leg places, caves, and camps that various different creatures have made for themselves across the land. Even for areas we don't see, the narration and conversations in this book often call out connections the clans have had to different places in past books to incorporate that lore, such as mentioning and being able to name the Sundrowned Water because of the new prophecy journey, and some kitty pets they meet having encountered Warrior Clan of all things. I still hope we can meet those guys again someday. In general, this book has a lot of moments where it calls upon older material when it becomes relevant, including Ivy Pool's past with the Dark Forest and Flame Tail for a moment of the stars, the sisters' culture and past with the clans, and even small things like the Blazing Star prophecy from Dawn of the Clans. It would probably make this a confusing book to pick up as one of your first in the series, but it is rewarding for fans who have kept up with everything until now. The book isn't just filled with callbacks, though. Actually, the bulk of, uh, at least the first half of it, is taken up by the main patrol of Ivy Pool, Dovewing, Rootspring, Icewing, and Whistlepaw traveling across the world together, farther than any living cats have before, and going through sweet traveling scenes. There are plenty of scenes where the cats get to talk to each other and further the arc and message of the story, but for ones that incorporate their environments more, the patrol meets a trio of kitty pets, Zeke, Pumpernickel, and Curry, who seem to be mousers for the two legs who own their barn and who protect their territory by calling in dogs to chase the other cats off. They also meet a pair of brothers from the sisters, Slate and Beach, who are very naive in regards to how to take care of themselves and flirt frequently to try and win over she-cats. <coughs> Badly. <laughs> then we have a loner that the two legs named Jake, no, not that one, who tells the patrol about the beach and introduces them to crabs. And best of all, to me, the cats launch a mission to rescue Whistlepaw from a monster after she was put there by a two leg kit, and the crux of the plan involves Ivy Pool stealing the two legs cheeseburger? Or maybe a breakfast sandwich. Uh, it said two white things with a brown thing and a yellow thing in the middle <laughs> in order to lure the two leg away from the monster. It's adorable. <laughs> now, none of these elements really have much impact on or relevance to the plot or even characters in this book, and all of them only last a chapter or two. They're certainly filler, and I know some friends who found it boring or draining. However, it's charming filler that shows us facets of the world and cats in it that we haven't seen before, and I genuinely enjoyed it. That said, it's undeniable that none of this is the main plot of the book. Traveling is a means to an end, both the literal locations and stories they have to reach and the character arc Ivy Pool goes through along the way. And that's something we really need to discuss. For the purposes of this video, though, let's begin with Ivy Pool's journey, because the plots in the latter half of this book are dense, and wild enough to send us on at least a dozen tangents. As many people predicted from the blurbs and preview of this book, the main character journey in Ivy Pool's heart is Ivy Pool learning to confront and move past her grief over Bristlefrost. In concept, I like this a lot. Warriors has had a very inconsistent relationship with character arcs in general, most often not including them, having them fall off partway through, or having them suddenly skip to the end. So having a book where Ivy Pool really does begin by refusing to let Bristlefrost go or be happy, and end by understanding enough about the world to see her joy everywhere and move on, is a rare treat. In particular, a lot of the dreams, or more accurately, nightmares she had about Bristlefrost, the Dark Forest, and even looping in Flame Tail, and 
uh, for some reason Broken Star, were really well done and efficiently showed us her pain. The end also gives us a really good and well-executed message, with Ivypool and Rootsprings sitting together as they begin to see Bristlefrost in everything, keeping her in their hearts while letting them move on. This is the first time Warriors has chosen to focus solely on grief as an arc, rather than as a background in a different story. And, of course, this is Warriors, where, when most cats die, their loved ones can expect to see them pop up again with the medicine cats whenever, and are practically guaranteed to live happily with them forever when they die as well. Death still means something to them, because, unless you're a medicine cat, you probably won't see your loved ones again until they die, but Ivypool has a different sort of pain since Bristlefrost's spirit was killed, and she can't ever go to StarClan. This book has several great conversations between Ivypool and others, as well as dreams and narration within her head that drive this arc along and help us to understand how she feels. And I wouldn't trade those away. It's a genuinely great arc, and I can tell Cherith Baldry, the ghostwriter for this book, put a lot of personal passion into it. However, I also can't help feeling some level of disappointment with the arc, and it mostly comes down to two things. First of all, we have the problem I already had when I heard of this idea. Ivy Pool's grief is based on a relationship that didn't really exist. We never really saw Bristlefrost and Ivypool interact or bond or even think about each other until Bristlefrost was dead. And over all six books where Bristlefrost was a protagonist, Ivypool only spoke 42 times, with only two lines each in The Silent Thaw, Veil of Shadows, and Darkness Within, and the highest amount being 17 lines in The Place of No Stars, which mostly comes from her being happy that Flipclaw is back or expositing on the Dark Forest rather than interacting with her daughter. Not only that, but if you believe the sparse references we've gotten over the years, Fernsong was the one who wanted to spend time with the kits more than Ivypool did. And this book instead shows him getting over his grief faster than Ivypool, while she doesn't even think about him more than three times over the course of the journey. I want to believe in the relationships and arcs that Ivypool's heart presents in order to enjoy the story, but I just can't forget how little these cats had relationships before, and it makes the level of anguish Ivypool demonstrates feel manufactured sometimes. The second point that makes this story difficult to take is the follow-through with character conversations. Ivypool does talk to all the relevant cats you'd expect during this book. Her mate, Fernsong, her kits, Thriftier and Flipclaw, Rootspring, who shares her grief over Bristlefrost, Dovewing, who shares the grief of a mother who recently lost her kit, Icewing, who shares the grief of a mother who lost her kit to the Dark Forest forever, and Whistlepaw, who is also on the journey for plot reasons. Ivypool even draws wisdom for her arc from the new cat she meets and the stories they tell, which is a good way of interweaving their wild plot with this very grounded character arc. She does share multiple complex and emotional conversations with each member of her journey patrol, but even then she sometimes repeats the same feelings and realizations multiple times, preventing the book from feeling as natural as it should. Ivypool's conversations with Dovewing are particularly odd, because while they do both act in character and have a pleasing amount of camaraderie by this point, they only seem to discuss events after Dovewing left ThunderClan. The conflicts and connection between them center entirely around their mates, kits, and new clans, rather than anything they went through or fought over when they lived together. I'm all for moving on and covering new stories, and I certainly prefer this to a super edition where we spent half the time flashing back to Omen of the Stars, but these two sisters in particular never had a resolution to the immense animosity between them in their time as protagonists. And I figured, as I'm sure many did, that the animosity would at least be touched upon in a book where these two go on a long journey for the first time since Dovewing left. That said, I don't consider it a fault of the book that it focuses on recent material. It's very rare, in general, for me to find a complaint that a story didn't go the way I expected to be a valid one. It's mostly just something to note. As a result of Ivy Pool's somewhat inconsistent pool of interactions, the other characters on this journey didn't get a whole lot of time to shine. Rootspring actually falls the most in the background during the journey, when he's not directly involved in a deep conversation about Bristlefrost, but when he is, his main purpose is being a cat that Ivy Pool is using to keep her kit and grief about her alive. They've been meeting up at the lake regularly since Bristlefrost died, and Rootspring has refused to get a new mate, even as Renflight has begun to pat after him hopelessly. If Rootspring refuses to move on from Bristlefrost, either in letting himself feel happy or looking into a new mate, then Ivypool is able to stay stuck in her own grief. 
We don't get to see much of Rootspring's internal feelings through the midsection of the book, but by the end, and with the same revelations that Ivypool has received about the world, he is ready to move on as Ivypool is, stop their meanings outside of gatherings, and consider getting a new mate. Though, to my pleasant surprise, he chooses not to go with Renflight and instead to wait for someone he would personally want to be with, rather than just someone who wants him. I kind of still wish that this was a realization Bristlefrost got back in Veil of Shadows, but that's long past now, and I'm happy to see the message told well here. Meanwhile, Dovewing doesn't have much of an arc, but does spend quite a bit of time with Ivypool, trying to reach out to her about her feelings, allowing her sister space for her emotions, and confessing her own feelings about Rowankit when Ivypool is ready. Part of Ivy's own arc, which was, uh, repeated a couple times over the book, was realizing that comparing her grief to others was only separating her from the cats who could most understand and support her. So it was less a case of Dovewing having to change and more her receiving the benefits of Ivypool changing, but it was nice. I really do appreciate having these two, both in character, interacting amicably and caring about each other. Next up is Icewing, who actually got more characterization than I was expecting. She has two prominent conversations, and outside of those, she acts as a generic she-cat, but those two conversations were more than I expected her to get as the least prominent cat on the journey. The first is when she reminded Ivypool that her own son, Beetlewhisker, also died in the Dark Forest and has been inaccessible ever since. Something I genuinely wasn't sure the editors would remember since it happened in Vicky's era. The second is when the cats on the patrol all witness a dream Icewing had about coming back to RiverClan. There, she found Frostpaw dead, and discovered that she was too late to stop the clan's destruction. When she's later alone with Ivypool, Icewing, in a show of genuine strength and resolve, declares how determined she is to return her clan to stability, safety, and happiness like they were under Misty Star. And from that point onward, she's one of the most punctual members of the patrol, always insisting they go as quickly as possible in order to finish their journey and make it back to the clans in time to save them. Additionally, while she didn't have many revealing conversations there, she and Ivypool were the ones to truly conclude the plot, by visiting, saving, and making allies of the new cats they found, and then journeying into the afterlife lands to see and hear the revelations and changes of that world. I'll get into those momentarily. I just have one other thing to cover before then, and I promise it's the quickest. Whistlepaw was mainly on this journey to... be a medicine cat interpreting the prophecy, acting as a healer, and speaking for Star Clan. The most exciting thing she does is get captured by a two-leg kid and a monster so that Ivypool can steal a cheeseburger, but mostly she's just there to direct the journey and be a message carrier for the vast array of new lore the book drops. And as a result, I think it's time to get into that. Okay, so this is the weird part. Roughly halfway through the book, Ivypool's patrol comes across a series of caged animals who are part of some sort of illegal wild animal capture program. They see a giraffe, a zebra, what I believe to be a skunk, uh, some sort of large snake, and what is probably a wolf before coming across two animals they can actually speak to, albeit in a stilted way. They are described as broader, brown tabby cats, and while I know a lot of people were expecting or interpreting them as tigers, I'm fairly certain that they meant genuine wild cats. European wild cats, like I'm showing here. The first pair of cats they meet are named Tumble Leap and Stock Purr, and Stock Purr is about to have kits, who they are afraid the two legs will steal when they're born and weaned. However, despite the offer of the clan cats to help them, they say they can't go because they're the last wild cats in the area and probably have a better chance at safety with the two-leg with so much of their home destroyed. While in conversation with them, they also identify the sign Whistlepaw saw in her vision that led them on this journey. Apparently, it's the symbol of... Storm Clan. Uh, the clan that birthed their group. This is not a coincidence, and the wild cats do not also call their groups clans. The clan cats are directed to speak with the wildcats' ancestors to learn more. And there, they meet Galestar, a normal not-wildcat and one of two leaders of Storm Clan. The story here is amazing. <laughs> so, so Galestar was a leader of Wind Clan soon after the dawn of the clan's era, and she fell in love with Stripestar, who was the leader of Thunder Clan at the time. Neither of them wanted to abandon their clans or their love, and obviously, even if clan swapping was allowed at the time, a leader would have a much harder time of it. Instead, they decided to join their clans together to make Storm Clan, and even invented their own Storm Clan symbol. 
Uh, side note, this also accidentally canonizes that all of the other clan symbols are actual in-universe symbols that someone made up and that the cats presumably know. Huh. Uh, anyway, the other three clan leaders began to fear how powerful Storm Clan clearly was, being twice the size of the others, and some pointed back to the Blazing Star prophecy from Dawn of the Clans, which told them to spread into five groups. This worsened when two legs encroached on the clan's territories, driving prey away, and Storm Clan was continuously blamed for the shortages. So eventually, Gilstar and Stripestar chose to take their new clan away and find a new place to live. It was a very long journey, with dying cats, rising tensions, and arguments between the two mates, first in private and then in front of their clans. Some cats left at this point, going back to the original territories and... uh... somehow? Reforming ThunderClan and WindClan the way we know them today. Back on the journey, Galestar had three fragile kits and wanted to stay by the sea, I, I, I mean sun-drowned water, until they were fit to travel. However, several cats pointed out that they had been traveling for nearly a year, and it was important to find a safe territory before Leaf Bear. And Stripestar agreed with them. They continued traveling, but Galestar fell to the back of the group as she was helping her kits, and a heavy storm hit. Galestar took her kits to take shelter in a crevice in the wall, and a rock blew in to block the exit. Her clan, and Stripestar, looked for her for a long time, but eventually assumed her to be dead and continued onward. Galestar took this as a clear betrayal from Stripestar, and, when she was eventually broken out by some wildcats, went to join them instead, and even became mates with one of the wildcats who saved her, Bound Hunt. They raised her litter together, and even had one of their own, and even Stripestar's kits eventually found mates among the wildcats. In the modern day, the Wildcats all know about Galestar and Storm Clan, the former as a great historical member of theirs, and the latter as the horrible cats who abandoned Galestar, but in doing so also gave her to them as an important ancestor. Now this is a buck wild story, completely unfounded in any previous material, and I absolutely love it. Warriors has been stagnating as a series for a while, relying on old cats, recycled plotlines, and bare-bones play-it-safe characterization. Gale Star, Stripe Star, Storm Clan, and the Wildcats are none of that. They're new, they're bold, they're fascinating. These are the sorts of ideas that fans will instantly grab onto as their minds start racing with interest, theories, and even ideas for future stories. And really, that's a great thing, because, based on everything the story team has been saying for a while, it seems like the 18th Super Edition will follow directly from the ideas in this one. And I wouldn't be shocked at all to see Gale Star, Stripe Star, or one of the cats who went back to reform WindClan or ThunderClan as the point-of-view characters for the 18th or even 19th Super Editions. For this book, though. Gilstar actually didn't know about the River of Blood part of Whistlepaw's initial prophecy, something about the clans facing danger if they didn't repay this debt, but she did send the dream because she wants the clan cats to help the imprisoned wildcats, and even lets them know that they still have kin over the mountain range. This whole section also gets multiple cats personally involved in the plot in a way that parallels their arcs. Rootspring is confused and upset that Gilstar moved on from her old mate with Bound Hunt. Ivypool is determined to not let Tumble Leap and Stockpur be separated from their kits by the two legs. Icewing and Dovewing are... Mm, moms, and have empathy and advice to share with Stockpur for that reason. And Whistlepaw is left with the puzzle of why StarClan didn't know about StormClan, if it was such a massive event in clan history. Ivypool, Dovewing, and Rootspring even have a brief conversation about whether or not they'd have joined their clans together, if it was what it took to be with the cat, or cats, they loved. I'm genuinely surprised by how integrated they made this. The Wildcats are saved and journey partway to the mountain, but then Stockpur has her kits, and Ivypool and Icewing continue on to find the Wildcats and bring them back, while Dovewing and Whistlepaw help Stockpur with her newborn kits, as she is particularly worried after having two prior stillborn litters. And Rootspring? also stays behind, and has nothing to offer except, maybe, protection? Ivypool even shows great care by reaching out to Dovewing to check if she's okay, or if the new kits are reminding her of Rowan Kit, but she promises she's alright. Ivypool and Icewing make it to the Wildcat camp, tell and try to convince them of their story, and are briefly captured before they save them from some foxes and prove their allegiance. During this whole section, we actually get to learn a lot about wildcat culture and beliefs, and it's treated respectfully, a culture different from, but as rich as, the clans, without being looked down upon for being cruel, stupid, or otherwise. It's a nice change for warriors, especially after Ivypool spent multiple chapters earlier in this book railing against the sisters' culture with every chance she got. The wildcats are given their first names at birth, and are then presented to their ancestors to get their second names. 
Once they're young or old enough to train, they are trained by all of the elder cats, whoever may be free at the moment, as well as one other cat. They have a very close relationship with their ancestors, with multiple meeting spots equivalent to the moon pool, and with the eldest members of their group, who also function as the leadership, letting the ancestors speak through them at important times. In addition, when new kits are born, a specific member of the ancestors will come to them and become their permanent spirit guide and companion throughout life, acting sort of like a spirit mentor. They also have one more set of beliefs about death, but because it ties into the most interesting takeaway, I'm leaving that for its own section. For now, I'll say that once the Wildcats trust Ivypool and Icewing, they lead them to a log that acts as another gateway to the afterlife, and they speak with Galestar directly, encouraging her to go back to StarClan and to bring Stripestar back and help StarClan to remember StormClan. The three of them travel along the River of Spirits, which apparently connects all afterlives. Ivypool sees and feels a pull towards the Dark Forest during this, which leads to interesting narration on its own, but they quickly arrive at StarClan. There, they meet the clan founders, Tallstar for some reason, and Ferncloud, who is taking care of Rowan Kit for Dovewing. They introduce Galestar, tell the Star Clan cats about Storm Clan, and as they do, Windstar says she can almost remember. As Galestar tells her full story, the wispy ghosts of Stripestar and the other Storm Clan cats begin to materialize around them. Stripestar and Galestar have a confrontation over his apparent abandonment. I still don't think that's a fully accurate assessment, but he should have been at the back of the patrol with her. And Stripestar says he really did love and search for her, but, as expected, he thought she was dead and needed to get every other cat to safety. StormClan is remembered, and StarClan has one last message. But I'll get to that in a minute. The Wildcat's afterlife is highly intertwined with this story. Not just the plot with StarClan and StormClan, but also with Ivypool's character arc, and by extension, Icewings. The Wildcats do have a StarClan-like afterlife so that their ancestors can speak through and guide the living, but they also have a system for when they are forgotten. Hey, hey look, we're reintroducing and tweaking the fading lore, again! When a clan cat is forgotten from StarClan, or when they fall into depression water in the Dark Forest, it is assumed that their spirit is lost. Windstar even mentions at the end of this book that when living cats forget about someone, cats in StarClan begin to forget them as well which is why she couldn't remember StormClan. However, when a wild cat is forgotten, they believe that they become part of the earth, air, and water, something they also pray to, as the clan cats do with StarClan. The lost souls are never completely gone, but they dissipate and become part of everything. Hearing this, seeing the StormClan souls come back, and seeing the afterlives of the world connected starts to make Ivypool realize that the world and beliefs of the clans are only a piece of the truth and both she and Icewing end up considering what this means for their lost kits. It's what leads Ivypool to her revelation that Bristlefrost can be with her forever, even if she can't speak with her, and lets her accept her grief. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this edition. It links together a lot of disparate lore across the series in a way that feels respectful, sensible, and fitting for the world and message they're telling. It also marks an extremely rare point where the clans are not shown as the most smart, perfect, moral, correct society, and Ivypool instead needs to learn about and from another group in order to conclude her arc as well as the plot. <laughs> I really enjoy it. Okay, time to finish this book, and it ties nicely into the concluding thoughts. Remember how Galestar didn't actually know about the River of Blood or the implied doom of the clans part of the prophecy? Well, once StormClan reunites with StarClan, the StarClan cats become very ominous and say they hope whatever Ivypool's patrol has learned can help save all the clans. Who apparently need saving? Which agitates Icewing in particular, who was already insistent on them getting home quickly to save just RiverClan. They quickly reunite the Wildcat family with the rest of their group. Ivypool tells Dovewing about seeing Rowan Kit with Ferncloud and resolves her arc with Rootspring, with him thinking about getting a new mate and her making peace with that. Everyone says goodbye and they turn towards home. That is where it ends. Uh, we don't know what happened in the clans, which we will have to assume will come in Star, uh, Book 6 of a Starless Clan, or even in the next Dark or Super Edition. As a result, I can't judge how well the prophecy or cliffhanger aspects of this reflect the real content until the future, but at the very least, it gives a fair bit of intrigue. And, of course, StormClan's inclusion in the story introduces a lot of intrigue as well. It gives us enough to chew on and think about, and until we actually know what will come of any of this, that's all I can say. This is definitely a book I have some mixed thoughts on. 
because the pacing of the story, long sections of which does constitute filler, inconsistent use of the support cast, and minor things like having a chapter of railing against the sisters prevent me from saying this book was a great success. And someone who comes in expecting a quality book in general might be disappointed. But for warriors, knowing how much they traditionally play things safe, cut corners, rush editing, and ignore characterization and the pasts of characters, Avipool's heart is a massive breath of fresh air. It gives a great message through its main character arcs, connects those arcs to the plot of the book, includes some extremely fun ideas for both the Aarons and us to play with in the future, and, for me, is genuinely just a charming and fun book for its entire run. I know not everyone will like it, but without a doubt, this is my favorite super edition since Hawkwing's Journey, which came out in 2016. It's not even close. If you're on the fence, I'd give reading it a try, especially since it will apparently connect to a fair bit of future material. At the very least, I enjoyed it, and I'm excited to see where they go with these ideas in the future. Maybe you will be too. Thank you for watching, and always remember that grief doesn't have to weigh on your heart forever. It can stay there, and it can be remembered, but it doesn't have to stop you from continuing your own life.